Hey guys, today we're going to talk about ecology, and that is the scientific study of interactions among and between organisms in their physical environment. Ecology is a very specialized branch of science. As you can see down here, I have a food web. Later on we'll talk a little bit more detail about what a food web is, but in general it's showing the feeding interactions between organisms. But ecology studies more than just interactions between organisms and another organism, like what they eat or what eats them. It also studies physical environment interactions. In this case, we're looking at a marine food web. And a marine food web is something that happens in the ocean. There are a few levels of organization that ecologists would use. These are specific to ecology, but they allow them to identify exactly what they're talking about. There's individual, population, biological community, ecosystem, biome, and biosphere. If we take a look at individual and population, Individual is quite simple. Here I have a picture of a penguin. It is a single individual organism. This one penguin is an individual. But when you look at a group of individuals, like this group of penguins down here, that's a population. This population interacts, lives together, breeds together, and so a population is a group of individuals that belong to the same species and live in the same area. If there were to be a polar bear with these penguins, and of course that wouldn't happen because polar bears are in the North Pole and penguins are in the South Pole, but if there was, the polar bear would not be part of our population. The population is only individuals of the same species. A biological community is an assemblage of different populations that live together in a defined area. Notice that both population and biological community rely on it being in a specific area. This community is a watering hole in Africa. You can see that we have multiple different organisms. The elephants, the gazelles, there's probably crocodiles in the water, there could be lions back in the bushes. That's all part of this ecological community. If we add something else, like the physical environment, we get to an ecosystem. It's all of the organisms that live in a place together with their physical environment. Only when we hit the ecosystem level have we actually added in our abiotic factors, those non-living things. If we take a look at this picture, we can see that there are quite a lot of different populations here. There's a population of frogs, a population of fish, populations of turtles, deers, raccoons, and hawks. There's even populations of insects such as the dragonfly, the ladybugs, and the water spider. All of those are organisms that make up this ecosystem, which includes their non-living or abiotic environment, such as the water, the air that they breathe, the land that they're on. An ecosystem is the first time that we add that non-living or physical environment. If we continue going to a larger scale, we hit a biome, which is a group of ecosystems that share similar climates and typical organisms. If we look here, we can see the Sahara Desert. It's a large desert across North Africa. It's also joined with other de deserts. But this line right here is a very clear biome. If we go south and we look into what would be where the Congo is at, this is another line of biomes. Each one of those is a grouping of ecosystems. You can be fairly certain that the ecosystem that is here will be similar to the one that is over here. A biosphere is our entire planet. It's all the organisms and the physical environment together. When we talk about the biosphere, it is literally the living sphere or the living part of our Earth. Bio meaning living. As I alluded to before, there are things called abiotic and biotic factors. A biotic factor is any living part of an environment. You'll notice that this picture over here focuses in on the birds, the grass, the tall river grass, the fish, the trees. Those are all living organisms. They're biotic factors. But things that are produced by living organisms are also biotic factors. So if one of those birds were to die, its carcass would be a biotic factor. A biotic factor is anything that's non-living part of the environment. Notice, all of the living organisms are gone from this picture. It looks very barren. It shows the weather, it shows the dirt, it shows the water, the rocks, but there's nothing alive there. And that's because abiotic factors are non-living things that have never been living and were not generated by something that was living. Rocks, water, and soil are all non-living factors. If we take a look at the environment together, it mixes in the soil, the water, the animals, and the air all in one. And quite frankly, when we look at the environment, sometimes it's hard to distinguish between biotic and abiotic. If we think about soil, for instance, soil will have biotic factors to it, like worms inside of it, or dead 
plant matter, but the actual dirt itself is abiotic. So when we look at an environment, it is a mix of biotic and abiotic factors. But if you remember that biotic factors are living or produced by living, and that abiotic factors were never living, then you'll get a really good sense of how to pick those out of an environment. Now let's talk about types of organisms. Primary producers are the first producers of energy-rich compounds that later used by other organisms. Primary producers in this picture are the grass and the watermelon plant. Watermelon is one of my favorite fruits. I absolutely love it. But this organism makes all of its energy from the sun through a process called photosynthesis. Unlike you and I, it is capable of creating sugars. Plants, algae, and certain bacteria can capture energy from the sunlight or chemicals to convert it into forms that living cells can use. These organisms are called autotrophs. The terms primary producer and autotrophs are intertwined and can be switched in and out. If we talk about photosynthesis, this picture sums it up very succinctly. We take carbon dioxide plus water plus light energy and then we end up with carbohydrates, that's sugars, and oxygen. Of course, we use both of these. Oxygen we require for metabolic pathways and carbohydrates we use as a source of energy. This only happens because we get them through the process of photosynthesis. We'll talk about photosynthesis in a later chapter in detail. Some organisms, however, live without the presence of life their entire lives. They produce carbohydrates through a process called chemosynthesis. And that's a little bit different than photosynthesis. Chemosynthesis uses chemical energy plus carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and oxygen and creates carbohydrates and sulfur compounds. These plant-looking organisms are organisms that are found on deep ocean vents, miles beneath the surface. They are not actually plants. They're much more like animals. But they are chemoautotrophs, which means they make energy out of chemical bonds. This is the one exception to the rule of thumb that all energy on, on the earth comes from light. Because these organisms are capable of generating energy when they have never had light put on them. Consumers are organisms that must acquire energy from another organism by ingesting them or eating them. We call them also heterotrophs. Hetero meaning different, trophs is how they eat. Heterotrophs can be called heterotrophs or consumers. Those are two interchangeable terms. However, we're going to talk about different types of consumers. First and foremost, carnivores. They kill and eat animals. It's very clear that if you're going to define something as a carnivore, that it kills the organism. Here we see a snow leopard. It clearly has uh, what looks like a snowshoe hair, and it is enjoying the meal after it has killed that rabbit. Scavenger are animals that consume the carcasses of other animals that have been killed by predators or died of other causes. Here we see a vulture eating uh, the carcass of a water buffalo along with this stork. These two organisms are being scavengers right now. They didn't kill this particular animal, but they are using it as a source of energy. This wolverine kind of brings up an interesting issue, though. Wolverines will scavenge when it's available. They're not going to turn down a meal. However, wolverines are quite capable of killing some organisms. So, in some ways, a wolverine is both a carnivore and a scavenger. You'll find that with some organisms. So, when defining it, you need to be very clear that a carnivore catches and kills, and then a scavenger is simply eating a carcass, something that's already died. Decomposers, such as bacteria and fungi, are feeding on chemical bonds and actually break down organic matter. This is very important because if decomposers didn't function, when you toss a banana out your window on the side of the road, the banana wouldn't go anywhere. They actually cause the decay process to happen. They're very, very important. And they break down these dead organisms into detritus, or small pieces of dead and decaying plant and animal matter. That detritus is a biotic factor. It was once living. Herbivores attain their energy and nutrients by eating plant leaves, roots, seeds, or other fruits. Typically speaking, we talk about herbivores as eating primary producers. This is an American buffalo. At one point in time, they would have ranged all across the Midwest United States, and they are herbivores. They eat only grass. Omnivores are animals whose diets include a natural variety of foods, both including plants and animals. This picture has two omnivores in it. The first omnivore is the pig. Pigs are not picky eaters. They will eat just about anything, even other pigs. This little baby human, of course, is an omnivore as well. We both eat both plants and animal matter. 
Detritivores feed on detritus particles, often chewing or grinding them into small pieces. This is an earthworm. It's classified as a detritivore because it eats the detritus particles that are already in the soil.